Hello and welcome to St James Church in Rawcliffe. As you can see, we're not in Rawcliffe and I'm not here. Well, you can see I am here, uh, but I'm actually off this weekend. But I managed to record this before I went off whilst I was working the week before I go away. And I, was, I have done for the next three weeks, uh, pre-recorded the services so that when I get back, I've only just got to add a sermon into the last one. And in the, on these three weeks uh, in between, we're going to have guest speakers from the Diocese of Sheffield. Uh, today I happen to know it's the Archdeacon of Sheffield, Malcolm Chamberlain, but I'm not sure who it is at other points. But I am very grateful to those who have prepared those sermons and put them online so that we could use them and I could go away knowing that you would still be fed by God's Word and by good teaching. Other than that, I don't think there are any major announcements. Uh, some people are sad to know that Mary Ager from Hook has died and that her funeral will be on the 14th in St Mary's Church but it will only be for the uh, invited family guests in church. If you do happen to be somebody uh, who's going to stand outside or wants to say greetings and final farewells to her uh, by being on the street please do so in a Covid safe way and in a safe way as well along the street or outside in the churchyard. Uh, because we don't want anybody else to become ill as a result of having had this funeral here in Hook. Other than that, I don't think there are any major announcements. Again, to say thank you to all of you who have contributed to these services, especially to Rachel, who's played the piano for these services in Rockcliffe. So we move on to our opening acclamation. God says... Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You that have no money, come, buy and eat. Why do you spend money on that which is not bread, and labour for that which does not satisfy? Listen to me, eat what is good, and delight in me. Come to worship. Let us pray. O God, you call us into the covenant made of old, to be your people faithful and true, to witness the good news of Jesus Christ. Let us come to you now that we might know of your love, that we might experience your mercy and share your peace with one another. Amen. Our first hymn is Let All the World in Every Corner Sing.
As we come to our time of confession, we're reminded that the Word of God is living and active. It judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. All is open and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we give account. We confess our sins in penitence and faith. Together we pray. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have wandered and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things that we ought to have done. And we have done those things that we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But you, O Lord, have mercy upon us sinners. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent. According to your promises, declare to mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live a disciplined, righteous and godly life, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Collect for the Eighth Sunday after Trinity Almighty Lord and everlasting God, we beseech you to direct, sanctify and govern both our hearts and bodies in the ways of your laws and the works of your commandments, that through your most mighty protection both here and ever we may be preserved in body and soul through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who is alive, and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. We come now to readings from the Bible. The book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 1 to 5. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labour on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me, Hear me, that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you because of the Lord your God the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendour. This is the word of the Lord. The reading is taken from Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 5. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption of sons, theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second hymn is Put Thou Thy Trust in God.
Jesus feeds 5,000. As soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. That evening the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, That isn't necessary. You feed them. But we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here, he said. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then, breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterward the disciples picked up twelve baskets of leftovers. About five thousand men were fed that day, in addition to all the women and children. This is the word of the Lord. If you're anything like me, you can't quite believe that August is upon us already. This has been the most unusual of years, and the COVID-19 lockdown seems to have compressed time, or done something very strange to it, at least. August is normally one of my favourite months, not least because of the good weather, although that's not guaranteed. And with holidays dominating, I do get a bit of a break from the usual volume of emails. As a family, we look forward to the bank holiday at the end of August, when we load up our car with camping equipment and travel south for the annual Greenbelt Festival, joining with over 10,000 other people for a weekend of faith-filled music, comedy and deep thinking. Sadly, I'll have to wait until 2021 for my 32nd Greenbelt weekend. Many of us will have been missing those opportunities to meet with fellow believers, be it at large festivals and pilgrimages, such as Greenbelt, New Wine or Walsingham, or in our local churches. I wonder if, like me, you have at times over the last few months read those gospel stories that involve large crowds in a different, even wistful way. Today's reading from Matthew's Gospel, The Feeding of the 5,000, is one of the most famous of those accounts involving a large crowd, and is recounted by all four evangelists. As we read it, our attention is rightly drawn towards the miracle at the heart of the narrative. But Matthew sets this remarkable event in the context of Jesus' own experience of loss. In the first 12 verses of Matthew 14, we read of how Herod was trapped into having John the Baptist beheaded. The grisly account ends with John's disciples telling Jesus what had happened. And our passage follows on with these words. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. Over the next few minutes, I'd like to highlight three ways in which Jesus acts in this famous gospel event. I'm going to talk about how Jesus acts in love, how Jesus acts in partnership, and how Jesus acts in abundance. Firstly then, Jesus acts in love. The compassion of Jesus is clearly spelt out for us by Matthew in verse 14. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. And this compassion of Jesus is even more pronounced, given the context that I've just described. Jesus wanted to get away from it all to mourn John's death, but he is spotted and a crowd gathers. I'm pretty sure that if that had been me, my first thought would have been, how do I get rid of these people? But Jesus' response was one of compassion. In the Greek, the verb phrase, have compassion, literally signifies a gut reaction. Jesus responds out of a gut level sense of compassion for the people, and he begins to meet their needs. 
Jesus always acts in love. It's his default mode. Our needs are his concern. Nothing is too insignificant and nothing is too colossal. Time and time again throughout the Gospels, we read of how Jesus responded in love and compassion, accepting people for who they are and meeting their needs. I wonder, do we really believe in this Jesus? Do we believe that the risen and ascended Christ lovingly meets us in our need? Are we able to trust Jesus with those deep inner secrets, confident that he always acts in love? Secondly, Jesus acts in partnership. As the night draws in, the disciples suggest that the crowd should return home to eat. But Jesus has other ideas, and so they find themselves in a slightly humorous situation that wouldn't be out of place in a Monty Python sketch. Having gathered up all the food they could lay their hands on, the disciples present to Jesus five loaves of bread, probably small ones at that, and two fish. An additional detail in John's account ascribes these items to a single boy in the crowd, but the crucial detail is the scarcity of the available food. How are we going to feed thousands of people? Well, we've got a couple of fish and five bread buns. If Jesus is able to feed all those people with such meagre resources, he could have just as easily produced a feast from thin air. But he didn't. He took the physical stuff given by people, maybe by one person, and produced something incredible with it. And what's more, Jesus didn't act alone. He fully involved his disciples, asking them to bring forward what they could muster, and then having blessed that food, telling them to distribute it to the crowd. Jesus acts in partnership with us. Again, such divine human partnership is a constant theme throughout scripture. Indeed, the Bible itself is a work of such partnership, God breathing his word as human authors write. And Jesus supremely embodies that same partnership as God incarnate, fully divine and yet also fully human. Jesus loves working with us and with the stuff of creation, such that from a small offering of bread and fish, he worked a miracle and provided for thousands. Incidentally, Matthew notes that the 5,000 was the headcount of the men only, the actual crowd was considerably larger. St Paul's well-known doxology in his letter to the Ephesians begins, Now to him, who by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. I wonder, do we really believe in this Jesus? Do we believe that the risen and ascended Christ can take the ordinary things that we offer, our time, our money, our relationships, even our very selves, and bring about miraculous ends. Which brings me to my final point. Jesus acts in abundance. Indeed, you could say that Jesus acts in somewhat excessive, even wasteful abundance. As if stretching out the meagre five loaves and two fish to feed well over 5,000 people wasn't enough, the disciples were then able to gather up 12 baskets full of leftovers, essentially waste. Such are the acts of Jesus, abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. Coming so soon after the kingdom parables we read last week, this miraculous event could be seen as an additional acted out illustration. The kingdom of heaven is like the feeding of a great crowd where all are included and none go without. And again, this isn't a one-off event. The gospels are littered with stories of feasts, over the top forgiveness and abundant generosity. Jesus acts in abundance. His unbounded grace is more than sufficient. I once heard a Christian speaker say that God is irresponsible with grace. The suggestion that God is irresponsible might not sit quite right, but the sheer extravagance of God's grace is a repeating feature of scripture. I wonder, do we really believe in this Jesus? 
Do we believe that the risen and ascended Christ is outrageously generous? As we face an uncertain future, not yet knowing the full impact of these months of lockdown, do we believe and trust in the abundant generosity and provision of our Lord? And so Jesus acts in love. Jesus acts in partnership and Jesus acts in abundance. And here's the twist. As his followers, Jesus calls us not only to trust that this is his way, but he also calls us to be and do the same. In our daily lives, may we too be people who act in love, who act in partnership and who act in generous abundance. Amen. We join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our third hymn is Break Thou the Bread of Life. As we come to our time of intercession for ourselves and for the world, we are reminded that the Bible teaches us, do not worry about anything, but in everything, 
by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Let us pray. Let us pray for the church and for the world, and let us thank God for his goodness. We pray for the witness of the church this week, particularly in places where the Christian faith is ignored and forgotten. We pray for those who carry major responsibilities as bishops and church leaders and are always expected to know what to say and do, whatever the situation. We pray for Philip, our vicar, for his continued hard work and compassion and also for the teams working in God's name at St. David's, St. Mary's and St. James. May they be granted strength to continue this work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Christians working in places of power and influence who make decisions which may affect many people. We pray that they use these gifts to act responsibly and wisely. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those whom we love, the special people who have come into our lives, whether they be family or friends. We pray that we will continue to support and care for others in our community with love and kindness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those for whom this day will seem long and hard, for those in hospital or ill at home, those struggling with despair or depression, those waiting for a job or important news or a friend to call. We pray particularly for those for whom this day will be their last. We name in our hearts any people we know in special need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember with deep gratitude those who have left their mark on our lives by giving us love and laughter, but have now gone before us to be with Christ. We hold them in our hearts, knowing that you, Lord, hold them in yours. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Drawing our prayers together as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn today is Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer.
a final prayer. God be gracious to us and bless us. May you have discernment to see whom to serve. May you have wisdom to know how to serve. May you have strength to serve. As a faithful disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, that brings us to the end of this service. Do have a great week and look forward to being back together next week when again I won't be here, although I will be here. Uh, amazing stuff, uh, but again I won't be preaching. Thank you to Malcolm for preaching for this week. Uh, God bless you all. Have a lovely week and may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love, both now and always. Amen.